We all know the name. We all know the look. We've seen the various portrayals over the years. Now it's time for Tom Hardy to don fedora and snappy suit and assume the role of the most infamous gangster in American history. But who was Al Capone, and what did he do to deserve his notorious reputation? Alfonso Gabriel Capone was one of the founders and earliest bosses of the Chicago outfit, the Italian-American organized crime syndicate based in Chicago. He was born on January the 17th, 1899 in Brooklyn, New York, to a pair of Italian immigrants. He was one of nine children. Two of them, Ralph Bottles Capone and Salvatore Frank Capone, would go on to work with Alfonso when he would build his criminal empire. And interestingly, one of his brothers, Vincenzo Capone, who would later change his name to Richard Hart, became a prohibition agent, battling the very kind of criminals his brothers had become. In his youth, Capone showed promise at the Catholic school he attended. However, his behaviour constantly landed him in trouble, and he was eventually expelled at the age of 14 when he struck a female teacher in the face. After this, he worked odd jobs around Brooklyn, and it was during this time that Capone became influenced by Johnny Torrio, the Italian mobster who would go on to become Capone's mentor. Capone became involved with gangs during his teenage years, such as the Bowery Boys and the Junior 40 Thieves, eventually joining the much more powerful Five Points Gang. Capone also found work as a bouncer and doorman, having been employed by a gangster called Frankie Yale. It was whilst working as a doorman that he got his trademark scars, after he insulted a woman when working the door at a Brooklyn nightclub. The woman's brother, Frank Galosino, slashed Capone in the face, and the subsequent scarring Capone received earned him the nickname Scarface, a title which he despised. He often attempted to cover up his scars, and when questioned about them, he would claim they were war injuries. At the age of 19, Capone married May Josephine Cowling, who had given birth to Capone's son, Albert Francis Capone, known as Sonny, just weeks before the two wed. Albert suffered from hearing loss as a child, losing most of his ability to hear in his left ear. In spite of Capone's notorious gangster lifestyle, as far as we know historically, the two were and remained happily married. Around a year later, Capone moved to Chicago, having been invited by mobster Johnny Torrio, who at the time was an enforcer for crime boss James Big Jim Colosimo. Capone worked as a bouncer in a brothel, where, due to his merry use of the institute's services, he contracted syphilis, for which it is thought he never sought treatment. There were tensions between Colosimo and Torrio, as the latter wanted the gang to enter into the bootlegging game after prohibition went into effect in 1920, but the crime boss refused. In the same year, on May 11th, Torrio phoned Colosimo about a shipment that was going to arrive at his restaurant, and when Colosimo drove there to await it, he was ambushed and killed. Capone has long been suspected in having an involvement in the murder of Big Jim Colosimo, another suspect being Frankie Yale, Capone's contact from New York. After this, Torrio took over Colosimo's operations, with Capone as his right-hand man. Torrio's syndicate was essentially made up of Italians and Italian-Americans, and he is thought to have favoured negotiation over territorial and business disputes between different gangs as opposed to violence and war, where possible. Torrio found trouble in the form of Dean O'Banion's North Side Gang, a small arrival of mixed ethnicity that were being pressured by the Jenner brothers, allies of Torrio, who were enroaching on the North Side's territory. In spite of Torrio's repute as a diplomat, O'Banion found Torrio unhelpful when he required the matter to be solved, and on November the 10th, 1924, Dean O'Banion was murdered at the flower shop he owned, an event either ordered or accepted by Johnny Torrio. The North Side gang was taken over by Jaime Weiss, a close ally of O'Banion, who wanted revenge for O'Banion's murder. Two months later, Capone found himself ambushed by assailants, which left him shaken but unhurt. Less than two weeks later, Johnny Torrio was returning from a shopping trip when he was attacked and shot. Heavily injured, Torrio would go on to relinquish his powers and effectively retire, 
leaving the 26-year-old Al Capone as the boss of the Chicago outfit. Capone's tenure as boss was one of intense levels of violence. His business was predominantly one of bootlegging, illegal production and traffic of alcohol. Prohibition was in full effect, the US nationwide ban on production, importation, transportation and sale of alcoholic beverages. Capone used violence and intimidation to increase his revenue. He would offer his beverages to establishments and those that refused were often met with brutal ends. Drive-by shootings and the blowing up of stores were favourites for Al Capone, and it is estimated that around 100 people were murdered in the Chicago bombings of the 1920s. As well as his violent methods, Capone was also well known for his now signature style, often supporting snappy suits, cigars, fedoras, jewellery and female companionship as he made his way to and from racetracks and restaurants. Unlike the vast majority of mobsters of his time, such as Charles Luciano and Vito Genovese, Capone was a magnet for the press, and he had no fear of having his picture taken and being interviewed by reporters. Rather, he enjoyed it and cultivated an image for himself that made him a favoured man among many of the working men and women of Chicago. He captured the public's attention, effectively becoming a celebrity. When questioned by the press on his illegitimate practices, he would often remark, I am just a businessman, giving the people what they want. Capone donated to charities to improve his public image, and he aligned himself politically with Republican William Hale Thompson, contributing $250,000 to his campaign at one time, and bombing voting booths in areas where Thompson's opponents had support. Tens of people would be killed on polling days by bombs and thugs hired to attack and gun down voters. In spite of his success and popularity, Capone had amassed many enemies and rivals, the worst of which were the North Side Gang. The North Side and the outfit often sparred in skirmishes, Tommy gun shootouts ending with blood-stained sidewalks and deathly still bodies splayed on the streets. Perhaps the single most famous event Capone is linked with is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929, which was orchestrated to assassinate Bugs Moran, the now head of the Northside gang after the death of Jaime Weiss and Vincent Drukey. Capone's men disguised themselves as police officers and initiated a faux police raid at Moran's headquarters, a trucking warehouse. They lined up the seven men they captured, and in came mobsters, armed with shotguns and machine guns, gunning down the men. The photos of this event, which I can't show for the fear of being demonetized, sent shockwaves throughout the public, severely damaging Capone's reputation. As boss of the outfit, Capone really took part in violence himself, and his distance from the illicit activities he was in control of, such as bootlegging and prostitution, as well as the police he had paid off, made it difficult for law enforcement to arrest and convict him of crimes. One incident Capone was directly involved with involved the discovery that three of his men were conspiring against him with rival gangsters. It is reported that Capone invited the men to dine with him and Capone's bodyguards, and after a night of drinking, Capone beat the men with a baseball bat and then had them shot, something that was reworked for a scene in Brian De Palma's The Untouchables. Although many historians feel the incident was falsified and spread to increase Capone's fearsome reputation. Capone was arrested many times, but rarely did trials end in convictions. Infamously, in spite of the numerous crimes Capone had committed in his life, it was tax evasion that finally got him in the end. Assistant Attorney General Mabel Walker Willie Brandt noticed that despite living lavish lifestyles, mobsters did not file tax returns. Gangsters such as Manly Sullivan and even Al Capone's brother Ralph found themselves in prison after failing to file income tax. And on October the 17th, 1931, Al Capone was convicted of income tax evasion failing to pay $215,000 in taxes on an income of over $1 million during a five-year period. He was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison, with his reign as Chicago boss lasting seven years. He was 33 and was sent to Atlanta U.S. Penitentiary in 1932. 
If Capone's reputation in Chicago was one of a legendary feared gangster, his repute while incarcerated was just the opposite. He was regarded as a weak personality, suffering from withdrawal symptoms as a result of a cocaine addiction. A fellow inmate feared that Capone was on the verge of a breakdown. It was in prison that Capone was officially diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea. In 1934, he was moved to Alcatraz, where he was stabbed by an inmate, and neurosyphilis quickened his demise, continuously picking away at his mental faculties. His last years at Alcatraz were spent in the hospital section, growing less and less competent at daily life. He was eventually paroled in 1939 after an appeal from his wife on account of his reduced mental capabilities. His later life was often spent in and out of hospital, sickly and weak, but grateful for the care he was receiving. He moved to his mansion in Palm Island, Florida, where he spent life with his wife and grandchildren. In 1946, after examination, his physician concluded that Al Capone had the mentality of a 12-year-old child. In January the next year, he had a stroke, and in the same month, a heart attack. Three days later, on January the 25th, 1947, surrounded by family, Al Capone died. Al Capone will be played by Tom Hardy in Josh Trank's Fonzo, which will focus on Capone in his later life as he succumbs to dementia and is haunted by violent memories. The actor has previously played notorious prisoner Charles Bronson and both of the British crime bosses Rogie and Rennie Cray. Thanks for watching.